Uh, hello, my name is Boris Mann. Uh, I work for Fission. Uh, I have worked in open source for a really long time. One of the things I like to say is that I worked in open source when that was still a radical act. Uh, we, uh, we fought a lot against uh, uh, Microsoft FUD and, and other things like that. Um, along with that, we practiced open source governance funding and et cetera a lot. We were in the, in the thick of it and it was something that was much discussed because it was, it was newer and people were figuring it out and it felt like there was uh, uh, lots of camaraderie and someone to, to sort of fight against in, in big proprietary software. Now we're on the other side of that. We won. Woo! Amazing. Uh, lots and lots of software is licensed under an open source license of some kind. That means it can be highly reused. Great. Super fantastic. Um, a whole generation of developers have grown up uh, essentially with uh, being like, yeah, I, I guess I put this on a code sharing site and I just use one of these open source licenses that I don't think very much about. And there you go. That's open source. Um, my three definitions of open source are one, it's a legal innovation. So, um, in fact, those, uh, licenses were created using the tools of copyright, uh, also sometimes known the open source stuff as copy left to lock open the codes so that it could be, uh, reused and shared. So that's, that was an innovation at the legal layer. Uh, uh, the next one really is the practice of peer based, uh, co-production of software. It's a long word, but that's like the part of like, oh yeah, multiple people work on stuff and have some systems and go back and forth and have some sort of governance model, <clears throat> which often we, 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 we mainly from open source are familiar with classic ones like benevolent dictator for life or BDFL. Again, long time open sourcers will be like, haha, lol, right. Um, if Joe, who runs the project, likes you, uh, and it's always Joe and they're a middle-aged white guy, uh, then your stuff gets in. Um, and uh, this is no way to form a system of government. We may as well use uh, a system where ladies in lakes give us swords to how decisions get made. Uh, the third one is ideology. Uh, I, for one, uh, believe that open source uh, software is very important. Uh, we have lots of big challenges and if we're constantly having to license uh, or rewrite software because it isn't open, it doesn't get us moving into those big, bigger challenges. Um, and it offends me that uh, basically there's a zero marginal cost to copy source code. We can copy the bits. It doesn't cost anything. Go ahead, use the source code. Except for a bunch of other things. Um, I talked about this a little bit. Um, governance in part, uh, especially in the context of something that's sort of internet first is the, the, the classic thing of why was I not consulted? Um, whether it's a commercial platform or a piece of open source software, uh, or a neighborhood block party, uh, people will feel bad and get grumpy if it feels like they weren't consulted in something that was happening. So in this uh, IPFS Filecoin cinematic universe, we've got some major pieces of software. And how are we connecting stakeholders broadly? Um, and is doing pull requests the only way to get priorities changed? This slide I decided to put in as <clears throat> kind of a placeholder because I think that we haven't really grappled with this. Um, I think there's some tools like star maps that might start helping, might start helping us ask these questions of who stakeholders actually are. Um, and that double-sided link of what the responsibilities are on each side of that link uh, and what sort of commitments are being made. So <clears throat> let's get back to funding. Funding uh, has a lot of power. Uh, because it enables people to, uh, uh, to work on things or perhaps choose to work on things. Um, I came up in open source um, when mostly uh, North America and Western Europe was online and mostly uh, relatively well-off 
white males had free time that contributed to open source. Um, it's something uh, that I'm aware of, um, I benefited from, um, and I'm also now looking where the internet covers the entire world, uh, how we can grow the pool of people who can produce software and get paid for it, and ideally in such a way that it remains open source in a path that doesn't require them to uh, step one, work for a company. You know, what does it mean to work on open source? The way that funding works, uh, a lot of this stuff looks like grants uh, or one-off projects. And I call those more like consulting. Uh, you put together some things that you need to deliver. And uh, that doesn't typically get us original research. And it doesn't get us long-term maintenance. So what do I mean by long-term maintenance? So really what happens if you say like, oh yeah, we're gonna put out a grant to get X built. You will get a, you know, a 0 0.8 version of X um, uh, that's been paid for and it's open source. So what's next? It's open source, it's cool, it's all, we're done, right? But just like with products, that's where the work begins. You know, do you pay for, you know, marketing and community work to get it adopted? Do you pay for the next year of maintenance and adoption? Where do new fe features come from? Or does it just get dropped off in some sort of shipyard and left there? So <clears throat> um, what parts of projects are experiments or proof of concepts that might be appropriate for that kind of grant approach? What is research? So we've talked about in this ecosystem of blue-green uh, teams or work. So blue work being more research oriented um, that unlocks new capabilities. Um, um, but as research is, it might not work and it might be you know, an initial uh, a piece of code that isn't operationalized to say run at scale or other things like that. And on the other end of things, how does important foundational libraries get built and maintained so that many green products and companies can be built on top? So these are the two things that I think we constantly have to grapple with, especially in areas where it, we're in these like Web3 distributed system spaces where it's like, yep, some of this is like new original work that is going to, in many cases, hit boundaries where you're like, I need to go back to a blue team and get a solution because I'm stuck here. I'm mostly going to have question marks throughout this thing. I don't actually have answers in this, just pointing to directions of what we might work on. Um, this is one thing that's not just a question mark. I'm a huge fan of Open Collective. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a platform where uh, basically you can create uh, a collective um, and get a fiscal host. What this means is this unlocks the sort of thing where you have a single maintainer running funds through their bank account. Uh, it means that you can immediately start at the repo project working group or event level uh, not need a full-blown organization um, and uh, give out, uh, take in funds and give out funds in a very, very flexible way. Uh, it also has built-in support for funding over time. Uh, so people can subscribe to $5 a year, $5 a month, uh, or $500 a month if it's an organization. And that's the kind of model that likely combines with grants to actually fund that long-term maintenance for more open source contributors. The world I'd like to get to is that we might have a certain number of contributors around the world, perhaps specifically not in North America or Western Europe, who make 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 US dollars a month, for which that would be very impactful. That would in fact be a small business. Um, and it is maybe a fifth the cost of hiring a, 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 a global north engineer uh, at a full-time company. Very interesting. Etc. cetera. <laughs> uh, there's many, many other things that go on from here. Um, we are trying to do novel things in novel structures. Um, I, 
got involved in part because I was very, very aligned with uh, the ideas uh, that uh, Juan Benet has been thinking about for a long time of, of how to build these networked organizations that work together in a network. How do you think about network level impact? Uh, and one of those things is, is really uh, encouraging everyone to not target the team or the company, but target the ecosystem. And a lot of that is like, hey, let everyone know that you're about to do X. Gather commitments. How can we pool some needs and resources? And those resources, that's always a funny word because it's like, in many cases, it either boils down to like cash or the typing fingers of N engineers. Uh, but I think there's a bunch more stuff in there around product design, adoption, promotion, marketing, uh, those classic things that also mostly get mi mixed when you hear open source project. Uh, let's get more open source computers paid around the world. Let's practice governance and coordination. So I recently uh, participated, did anyone else in the room participate in the uh, IP, IPFS impact eval ev evaluator round? A couple, couple of you folks. So it has an interesting interface to do quadratic voting. And might we actually practice using those interfaces rather than just every six months? Maybe we do them to prioritize features. Uh, so might engineering teams uh, give out points uh, to certain stakeholders that they want to have involved in decision making and use quadratic voting to prioritize things? Might we use it in scheduling our, our unconference schedules so we can get a sense of who's attending what or what might be popular uh, ahead of time? And it goes on for there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a big area. I think we're with things like permanent full-time open source contributors who are paid by a non-organization that is a website. These are some of the things, uh, a lot of these things are also explored in more Web3 contexts. And I'm saying we don't need to be blocked by waiting for uh, cryptocurrency or DAOs. We should experiment with those as well, but we should take these same patterns and start using tools like Open Collective uh, and, and start doing these things today. That's all I got for you. <laughs> Questions, comments? Hi, thanks for having this talk. I think it is super important, especially for the long-term health of something like an open standard or open protocol. Um, one of the, for Open Collective specifically, so one of the things that, you know, uh, Web3 and DAOs bring to this conversation is actually kind of similar to that uh, impact evaluator workflow, which is the, a voting mechanism. Is Does Open Collective have something like that, like a, a voting tool for, or do you have to, is it just the kind of fiscal sponsorship aspect where a somebody, one email address somewhere has the key to unlocking the funds of the Open Collective. So how, how does, in that world where you're using Open Collective, instead of dog fooding the Web3 DAO version, how do you connect that decision-making uh, part from the community to the budgetary part in yeah, Open Collective? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I, there's a whole bunch of other things in there where I also think it's very important that um, we should be having conversations with users of software. So like with a software library, this is usually organizations or other things like that. Um, but higher up that end users should also be like, oh man, I love this software and I wanna have it stick around. And $5 a month is a, is a vote. These other systems aren't built in yet. One of the ways that I would build that is, is literally say, okay, great, guess what? you get to participate in emoji voting on our next three features. Oh, no, no, you don't get to make up new ones. We're writing the software. We know what we're doing, but we're going to do a participatory process of saying, which of these are higher priority in, in different ways? Uh, that's in some ways, again, like, oh, damn, that's the et cetera part. That's, that's hard, right? And, and in fact, like, it's not built into GitHub, um, you know, and whether or not continuing to consolidate on one single platform of GitHub is even a good idea. Um, so uh, you usually have multiple admins um, and everything is done transparently already. So budgeting, you, like if someone says like, 
I did this thing. I'd like to get paid five hours for this thing that I did. Um, that's relatively uh, transparent, but a lot of those other things you're right, like happen like outside of the bounds of that at the at the end of the day. So that's an area where where we'd need to look at other things. Does Open Collective have an API? Or yeah, we can hook it's, it the entire platform is open source. It's got web hooks. Um, uh, Ian built. Uh, they have some event features that are like so so. Um, like they're fine. And then you actually built uh, a whole like event website that was driven off of Open Collective, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, basically all of the data associated with any particular Open Collective page, uh, well, most of the important data is published as just JSON files that you can pull. Um, and so we built a whole front end on our website that like pulled the list of registered attendees and like displayed them in the website from the people who had actually registered in Open Collective. Um, to actually take them through the payment flow, we, we were able to generate a specific page for each subscription tier and then just send people directly to that page uh, from the button on our website. Um, one of the ways I think it could also work with a more sort of democratic or DAO based funding mechanism is if you had it, like I think that Boris is right that you want the orgs receiving the funding to, you know, maybe not necessarily be run totally democratically as a DAO, but like have <laughs> admins who are responsible for the project actually administering things. But if um, Protocol Labs or a larger organization that has access to a lot of funds is choosing which organizations would get open collective donations, that could be run as a more democratic participatory Web3 process like Gitcoin. And then those bounties could just be paid out to open collective orgs. And then those orgs, like the thing that's great about open collective is it's open nature. You see exactly what the org is spending all of that money on. And so, you know, we raised more money than we needed for our conference and we just have a bunch of money sitting there in our fund that we've promised to use for certain things in the future. But like, you know, the actual accounting of hiring a different organization to host our servers, we were able to pay them directly through Open Collective because they also had an Open Collective. Yeah, so there, this is, this is a, a very interesting, so there's another tool related to um, Open Collective called Back Your Stack. And what it does, you can go in and put your GitHub details in uh, and it will scan all of your dependencies and it will show you which of those orgs have Open Collectives. Uh, and so this is sort of this other model, right? So uh, Fission has, has already uh, started um, making sure that we're like paying our dependencies. We want them to stick around. We want them to be stable libraries. Um, and we should, you know, put some money in the kitty to make that stuff happen. And of course, we can start thinking about whether it's a star maps model or an open collective model where you actually have very like local decision maker around like, oh, we should direct some funds over here. And all of those flows end up being uh, really interesting in a, in a system. Th thanks, Boris. Yeah, so just to help me get really concrete on this, we talked earlier about maybe we should have an open collective for star map and Vision would like to put money towards that. Maybe PL Andres wants to. So let's say people do. Who, at the end of the day, is getting to decide, yes, we're going to reward this person in this part of the world $1,000 for that feature that they just pr uh, produced. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, that that's that's the like formation of uh, like, like, what is the governance model of star maps is what you're actually asking me. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's not built in to to open collective. Very roughly the way that I've been thinking about it um, is we don't want to be in a situation that it actually just becomes consulting. There's the part of like finding some qualified individuals who are comfortable with the code base, right? So there be, should be a bunch of like starter grants that are very well defined that are basically like, hey, do this thing, do a PR, do this, get it merged in, we'll give you 50 bucks, mm -hmm. right? Just to like get people over the, o over the bar, right? And, and then we've got this other tier of like fairly well scoped it. Who does the scoping? How does that get reviewed? Code base, like this is the same practice of doing this inside a company one way or another, right? With, with, uh, with some processes that ideally like scale, uh, uh, basically, where ideally what you'd wanna do is you'd wanna find a, a, a situation 
where someone has the time available and the interest available and the skills available to be like, yes, I can put um, uh, 10 hours a month into this. And it'll be a mix of some new feature work, some maintenance, Dependabot grooming will take five of those. Uh, if it's written in JavaScript, you know, that, that sort of thing. So um, I don't have these parts figured out. It's the kind of thing where I'd love to take a couple of projects and put what amounts to $500, $1,000 a month into a couple of these and go like, let's actually get this outside of the bounds of our organization, mm -hmm. right? So either we fully staff some of these projects because we're doing them and they're crucial, uh, which will cost 20 grand a month, mm -hmm. or <laughs> we see if we can actually turn them into even more broadly um, uh, supported open source projects um, uh, that get uh, uh, a much wider community outside the boundaries of our of our current network, right? Mm -hmm. So it's call for experimentation. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. that's fair. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Uh, one of the challenges that I think IPFS specifically has. In, in this area, and, and I know that you know this is this is really not specific to IPFS. You can apply it like to Star, Star Maps or something. But one of the challenges with IPFS is that, like at this conference, there's not a lot of its biggest users represented, and many of its largest users might actually we don't know who they are even because they're pulling data through the gateway and publishing CIDs and then pulling data that way. Um, I'm not sure I have a question there other than I'm thinking about how to apply the system to where you don't have that strong relationship between that, that, that user base and the draw and the people who are investing in that. Um, you know, in our situation, clearly there's one major funder organization for a lot of it. But how do we get to that? that I'm thinking a lot about that transition to a world where the funding of IPFS is more directly tied to its biggest users and how that might use some of these tools. I think that grants are also relatively opaque and are run by someone, and it comes, like, comes from this central. It doesn't matter what it is or what other web free or whatever. And um, with this, like to me, this is like it's all out in the open. You can see what the dollars are. It's all there. And there's this. There's these two parts. There's this invitation to have agency and be like, I'm in for five bucks a month, right? As an individual, as an organization. I would start looking around at organizations, stakeholders who use some of these things and be like, why is your logo not on this page for $500 a month? And the uh, network goods team is looking at some of this stuff with hyper certs and I'm like, cool, you can figure out your magic open certs. I think we can start prototyping this now. Uh, and I think that, that in fact, we can turn that classic loop of, of, of like, almost like passing the hat, but passing the hat at the corporate level where it's a hundred bucks a month or 500 bucks a month, where, where you're like, but that actually adds up like pretty quickly. Um, so I think that's some of the other dynamic of, of like, of course, if you don't literally put it out there and show like, this is the, it, it, there's, n there's not a tiny magic gnome we've got trapped in GitHub doing your issues for you. Right, going like, oh, that's really great that you've come up. Are you a contributor? Uh, and I think that's where some of my thinking is these days and thinking about open source licensing. This is a whole other thing. Um, uh, various people have thought that, that we should tinker with open source licenses. There's a whole class of thing called fair licenses where like, oh, if you make money, you have to buy a license. What's being asked is to run that open source product. That, that's a business. That may be a business model and that's totally great. I'd like to explore the solution space that is like, oh yeah, we actually won't look at your issue or answer your support questions other than in a broad community bucket that kind of comes last, unless you're a contributor, right? Everybody gets the code for free. The scarce resources that is the humans is in fact gated by like, yet yeah, you have to be a contributor. Uh, not just cash. Oh, you you did some documentation. Amazing, you're a contributor. We're happy to help. Uh, pl plus a thousand to that. Uh, one of the biggest challenges and, that I think, and the thing, one of the, one of the ways that we've been thinking about closing the gap in this specific challenge in IPFS implementations over time is something that you know we've talked about a bunch of times in this 
specific events and it, how the 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 barrier to entry and being a part of the decision making entity around how the protocol actually functions and is implemented and run at scale is so high that the the users with the most needs are locked out of that process. And even the ones that are sufficiently technical and can at least peek and be like, I think that needs to change over there. Like Fission, for example, is very difficult to cross, cross to transition from that to actually being able to participate in making the change. And if you can run your open source community in the way that you just described, where people that need changes must participate in the making of them, it, you might end up in that world, but you also face that barrier to entry challenge if the project isn't starting from scratch. For projects in motion and have been around for already what almost a decade at this point, it's it, it's a little harder, and you do have to invest in reducing those barriers. And I think that actually says something about your open source projects culture and values as well. Uh, is the investment in how high or low those barriers to entry are for your users to be part of that maker community, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Uh, continued topic. I'd love to do more about this. You know, this is like intent to ship experiment. Um, and sounds like Molly was a plus one on let's try it with star maps. Um, and it would be amazing to find, you know, two or three other projects that might be a, a good fit uh, for this and really just like run some experiments, right? Maybe we can get some of them prepped and up and running and uh, ahead of IPFS camp and use that as an in-person thing to onboard a bunch of people, right? Have a bunch of those like $50 tier ones to get everyone used to using that kind of thing in person. You in? Yes. I have like 10 more questions to add to your slides. <laughs> let's, let's catch up later. I want to make time for that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.